Hello, welcome to Laughing Place Movie Club. Uh, we're back-ish. Um, this is my first time back on Laughing Place Movie Club in a long time. What about you, Mac? Yeah, we did Spider-Man No Way Home last week, but aside from that, it was a long break before that. Oh yeah, you would have been critical for that one. Um, I will have to go back and tune in because I was, I was away, um, but I loved that movie. Uh, but we're talking about a different movie today. We're talking about The King's Man, the prequel to the other two films from 20th Century Studios in this franchise. And it's only playing in theaters. So uh, we're talking about The King's Man. If you have not seen it, if you want no spoilers, um, maybe don't watch this now. Maybe come back and, and enjoy this after you've seen it if you want to uh, be part of a, a conversation. But we are live now. The comments are going. So if you want to join us in the chat or, or have any uh, aspects of the film you want us to talk about, feel free to let us know. Uh, Mac, what's your history with the Kingsman franchise? I know it's based on, on a graphic novel. I know you're a, a comics guy. Did you have any experience with the graphic novel before the films? No, this is one of those movies that I, I saw it and I really enjoyed it. And then in you know my research of it, I was like, oh, this is based on a comic. That's really awesome. And then I, I never actually uh, went back and read it which I should do because I like uh, Mark Miller and his work. So um, I should go back and check that out at some point, but I haven't gotten to it yet. There's there's quite a few Marvel comics I need to catch up on first. But um, no, I, I really liked the first movie a lot. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. It was one of those that surprised me because I didn't know what to expect going into it. And then it was really fun. And um, well, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this one a little bit and how it kind of went in a different direction. <laughs> yeah, and and the first one too, my my older brother was here in California visiting me. Like I have a really fond memory of seeing uh, the first Kingsman in the theaters, directed by Matthew Vaughn, who did X-Men First Class, which in my opinion is is one of the best of the X-Men films. Um, so this the series started out on such a high note, and then I never saw the sequel because I was told that it wasn't good by multiple people who aren't even like, film snobs so i was like okay if these if these people who are liking stuff that i think is kind of rubbish um are telling me it's bad then it must be pretty bad and i'm not gonna waste my time on it but i had to see this one for review purposes uh before we get too much into the kingsman um we have a question from uh, a very strange person i've never met before named kyle burbank um <laughs> who wants to know if if you're if you're in new jersey yep Yep, as you can tell from the window, according to Kyle, that it, it looks looks nothing nothing more Jersey than what's outside my window right now. <laughs> I thought Jersey was like back alleys, gangsters. Um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of there's a, there's like four different states in this one state. Like there's you got you got North Jersey with all the uh, you know Newark and cities like Bayonne, like where the Sopranos was shot. Uh, and then you've got if you go northwest, you got the mountains, and if you go. You got the Jersey Shore, of course, and so there's there's like a lot of different areas in New Jersey. <laughs> GTL, um, yeah, that's that's fun. I've never been uh, across the it, it's across the Hudson, right? From yeah, New York City. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever gone across it. I've seen it um, <laughs> yonder, but haven't gone over. So the King's Man, uh, the prequel, supposedly the origins of of the Kingsmen organization. Uh, what are your overall feelings about the film? How did you how did you enjoy it? And did you risk your life to see it? <laughs> well, I I will say this the screening that I went to had about six people in the theater. So it wasn't too risky. So that was nice. Um but it 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 was fine. Um <laughs> it it wasn't, you know, it kind of loses the fun of the first movie. I think when you you're doing it's kind of weird to call this a period piece, but it kind of is. Like you you're going back uh you know way back in time really so um it, it, i feel like it kind of loses the fun it becomes a little bit more serious and you don't you don't get that same element that you got from that first movie but i don't know it, it was still entertaining at times and i mean there was one plot point that that you know i really did not see coming which we'll talk about in a little bit here but uh you know it was fine it wasn't i wouldn't recommend rushing out to the theater to go see it i'll put it that way yeah this this in my opinion is definitely a wait and see it at yeah. home um for for as low cost as possible because 
Uh, I didn't like it very much at all. And, um, and I was really disappointed with it. But yeah, this has a really weird tone. It tries to have some fun like it did in the first film. It has a couple of those action sequences, but then it also has this really heavy handed uh, main uh, character arc for, for Ray Fine's character um, that's just full of loss and tragedy. And, and so it's, it feels so weighted down. It's like all the fun has a paperweight sitting on it, keeping it from blowing it away. Um, and it, it just felt so, uh, I don't know, so, so bound to, to this Rafe Fiennes character story. And I also felt really disappointed in that the marketing branded it as the origins of the Kingsman. But in my opinion, the Kingsman is founded between the prologue and what comes after the prologue. And we actually don't see that. Right. Like, we see the inciting incident, but then we don't see like how it got formed, how all these people got pulled into it, you know? Um, and I thought that was a huge disappointment too. Like you kind of wanted to see this, um, you know, the, the Avengers starting to assemble in yeah. this piece. And we, we, I felt like we really didn't get that. Yeah. I definitely expected, yeah, I guess like you like you're saying, like comparing it to the Avengers, like different agents and stuff coming in. And instead you got like this this secret team that had been working for years. And it's like we needed a prequel to the prequel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. It's bad when your origin story is um needs its own origin story. Yeah. So uh the other thing I want to talk about is the the villains, the the big bads, because that was something that was always fun about the original to me. And and this one had some good ones, but I feel like it's such a Batman and Robin to like throw as many as you can at the wall. And in my opinion, this one had one big bad villain who was like orchestrating everything, but very much a mysterious figure, you know, puppet pulling strings that then didn't end up being more like that villain wasn't more exciting than the others that they had faced leading up to them. So it was like your boss level was should have been your first level. Yeah, and then they introduce um, what's his name, Baron Zemo, the actor who plays him from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and you kept waiting for him to have a big role, and it's very clear that he is set up as probably the big bad for the next one, which I don't think is going to happen based on box office numbers and audience reception, which is a real shame. Yeah, I I loved uh, Daniel Bruhl. Uh, he I love that he is just playing Zemo again. Like they just changed. Oh him. yeah. Brought the character over. It's like they right. brought fur coat like, and all. Yeah, they're like, hey, we love what you did with Marvel. Can you just do that? Like, just just keep that same character. Um, yep. Which again, I I loved him. So that that was great. But I do wish he had more of a role. I felt like he should have, you know, probably had one of those big fun action sequences. Um, the, yeah, he the, was just in the group chat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was his role. He was the one trying to manipulate other leaders and like, you yeah. know doing the behind the scenes stuff, which is cool, but it has to lead up to him having a, a bigger role. Um, yeah. The reveal of that big villain, I, I, my problem with it really was, I think it was about 15 minutes into the movie that I realized who was going to be the big villain. You know, if this- It was really was, not hard to figure out. Right. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the guy says, oh, my mole within the government, like says it very like tongue in cheek. And then you see this guy and you're like, I don't trust this guy in the government here. And well, put two and two together. So- um, that was my problem with most of the movie was that it felt very predictable mm-hmm. until we got to one point and I don't want to jump around too much. Um, I don't know where you want it to go next, but, um, I, 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 I thought, you know, with this being the, the Kingsman, the origin of the Kingsman, I kind of anticipated the younger character being sort of the one that they're going to go forward with. So I'm mm-hmm. looking at Conrad as the main character and then they give him this great, action sequence he becomes the hero and then promptly gets shot in the head yeah that was that was another criticism i had with it was for the first two acts it really doesn't know who its main character is and yeah. and you're kind of like you, you know yeah you are pulled and thinking like am i supposed to be more on team conrad or more on team uh rafe fine's character um uh orlando oxford yes. and and then yeah they they kill off one of the two lead characters and then the third act it's it's the Ray Fiennes show um which led to I mean the the Kingsman always has ridiculous moments but this one was like laughably ridiculous and I don't think it was meant to be funny the whole plane crash descent to the top of the mountain and then like in the end you just happen to land there kind of like (laughs) 
funny goat moment, but the whole thing was just, it seemed like 10, 10 superfluous minutes to fund a uh, visual effects studio for a year. Yeah, it, it was definitely pretty ridiculous. And there was, first of all, I want to say too, I, uh, I, I probably going to butcher the pronunciation of his name, but uh, Jimon Hansu, uh, mm-hmm. who's from Guardians of the Galaxy and a lot of, ton of other things these days, but yeah, uh, he was great. And his action sequences were a lot of fun. And I kind of thought they were setting it up for him to like show up and be the hero in the end, like to, to you know, have that big save of the main character. But it, it wasn't, it was a goat that saved the main character. And it's like, yeah. like you said, you, there was a funny moment with the goat earlier and that was fine. You know, that's, that's fun. Throw that in there. But then to have the goat be the one that kind of saves the movie, mm-hmm. um, a little weird. So yeah, it didn't really land for me. Yeah, and the actress's name is escaping me, but uh, in addition to uh, Jamon Hansu, who plays Shola, there's the the maid character. She's a maid in her, her uh, I guess that's her alias. To everyone yeah. who comes over, she just appears to be the help, but she's also part of the, the team. Um, and her character yeah. was great too. And both of those characters felt like they needed to have more to do. Um, they did give them like a little bit of action in the end, but it was like, cheese flying in one person's face and and the other guy was really just there to you know watch a goat so yeah. <laughs> yeah uh Gemma Gemma Arterton I believe is the actress who plays Polly yes yes Polly uh is the character and, and yeah her her whole part was great and and you just felt like you wanted more of her yeah. um out of it uh I'm curious to know what was what was your favorite moment or the scene that 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 you were most drawn to yeah, it, it's the fight scene um, once they are actually in the, the barn and they have that sword fight and you get mm. that really unique shot of, um, you know, the like weird, like from the swords perspective, like where you're like, I, I feel like I had never seen anything like that in a fight scene before. And that's what these movies have been known for is giving you these, you know, really beautifully shot epic fight scenes. And this didn't come close to like the church scene in the first movie. But uh, it still gave us some really uh, cool, fun, unique things to enjoy. Yeah, that was cool. I'd actually forgotten about that. I guess that final fight was was still cool. Uh, like was was cooler than I I remembered it being. For me, the Rasputin fight stole the show. Um, it was just so weird and and very character driven. Yeah, um, which is another thing I appreciated. So I felt like the movie really peaked at that that Rasputin three-way battle yeah um although i i personally didn't love the the sexual undertones of yes. it there was some weird stuff um, <laughs> it was really weird and i get it like it's the it's the 30s it's or 20s even it's world war one um yes. era you know anastasia of the disney 20th century studios animated musical is alive in this and has a, a bit part um and rasputin the villain from that film is a villain in this film um which I feel bad for the real Rasputin because I don't think he was really a villain. He was uh, uh, their priest or whatever. But anywho, uh, we keep vilifying Rasputin. And, um, but yeah, the whole the whole concept of, you know, Conrad being told, oh, you're going to be the, the weenie because he's into younger men. And then the plot twist of, no, I'm actually into dads. So yeah. I'm not Rafe Fiennes. Um, and that whole moment, I mean, I guess it was it was funny but it just seemed like it over dominated things. And then for a film made in 2021, you kind of expect them to not, uh, to not go that route, I guess. Yeah. I get that the story is set when it's set, but the film is made when it's made. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's, it's a weird line to, to walk, but I did love, I loved that whole, whole fight. And it really made me want to eat whatever that poison tart was like, that looks good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to imagine that's the first time you've ever said that before. Uh, <laughs> I would have, I would have risked, I would have risked death on that poison tart. Um, yeah. But I have also been on keto for for six months and craves yeah, sweets all the time. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree. The fight scene was fun, and totally agree about everything leading up to it. it was I just felt very uncomfortable watching it. Like it is, it didn't hit the right way. I guess the way they in, like, expected it to. Yeah. Um, Reece. Well, and I also didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't recognize Reese Fons. Yeah, I, that's how you pronounce it. I only knew it was him because I saw, you know, looking at the cast beforehand, and um, yeah, he's one of those actors that's just a chameleon. He can he can look completely different in every movie you see him, and uh, really engulf himself in whatever role he's in. And yeah, he's 
Um, he was good despite his, uh, you know, his very weird <laughs> written part. Um, and the fight scene was fun. Like you're, you're right. Like there was a, like a lot of dance fighting, like Russian dance fighting, which is something you don't typically see. Um, mm-hmm. so that was interesting. My only problem with it though, was this was still in the buildup phase, right? Like we're still getting to know these characters and we, we want to get behind. This is the origin of the Kingsman. These guys better be, you know, as good as we've ever seen. And they kind of just get their butts kicked in this fight, like pretty easily. Um, yeah. I mean, literally being caught with their pants down. So it was, uh, it was kind of rough to watch that and be like, okay, how am I supposed to get behind these characters now? Yeah, and and it was, I mean, the more that I talk about it with you, the more I feel like, wow, this really was like a video game with like three three bad guys at the end of at the end of chapters, not yeah. counting not counting the war, because um, that was just sad. But um, yeah, you've got you've got Rasputin, and then you've got the the scarf lady Matahari, mm-hmm. um, which that was an interesting fight too. And you're you're right with the choreography, very much of a dance. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting to see the, I guess the gender dynamic of of a man fighting a woman with a scarf, um, <laughs> Kashmir. And then that was another ridiculous moment. Like I get it, it's all fiction and and playing with history, but the whole like. Have you seen this type of fabric before at the at the the garment shop? And they're like, oh yes, that's rare. It's from this one one plateau in the world. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's where it is on a map. Oh, let's go there and see what happens. Oh, that's where they are. Okay. Right. You know, it, was, it was a little, a little uh, too much. Yeah, that definitely earned an eye roll uh, for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> Matahari, I thought was a really really cool character, and I thought her fight was a letdown. Like she lost too quickly. Like I, I thought yeah. I wanted to see more of her. I thought she would have been, um, you know, a more formidable villain. Uh, the way it was, a, up. it was a quick one. And I wonder, I wonder how much of that was them, you know, cause it is on the, on the back end in terms of like producers, writers, directors, um, it's a pretty male heavy, uh, creative team. And I wonder how much of that wasn't like, we don't know how far to take this. Yeah. Um, and maybe they should have had a, a woman, a woman's opinion in the back to uh, to help balance that because yeah, that definitely coulda, shoulda, woulda been longer, um, and they could have had more fun with the White House setting of it yeah, too because yeah, they were really fun. just in like a sitting room off the Oval Office, and uh, they could have yeah. taken that further. Um, so uh, by the end of it, I'm sure you stayed through the credits. Yeah. Um, so we get a we get a tease at what's to come. I'm curious to know. Uh, even though we're both let down by the King's Man, do you still want a follow-up to the King's Man that would still be a prequel to the first King's Man? So, I don't know, you know, I guess this would, you know, if they're doing, doing a sequel to this, it would still be, you know, with what they set up, it would still be a, a prequel. Like, we're not bridging the gap between the two here. There's still quite a quite a bit of time to, uh, to mm-hmm. fill there. I also, I like the idea of playing with history a little bit and, you know, explaining something like you mentioned the X-Men first class before, like they, they play around with some history in that, but not to the point where it has to be like completely different. And it feels like that's the direction when you build up to Hitler, I think we're getting to a point where (laughs) where things are getting a little too wild. Yeah. There's nowhere else to go, but Hitler, um, which is the the tag. If you, if you stay through the credits, it's Hitler. Hitler's next. (laughs) I get um, it. I get that that's sort of the big splash of like, you know, with Marvel, it's going to be like, you're going to introduce this exciting character. Well, you're playing with history here. So who's the character that you're going to introduce? Yeah. It, I guess that's the big move. But like, I don't know. I don't know that I want to watch that. <laughs> well, and Captain America First Avenger is still my favorite of the MCU films. I get I get flack for that all the time. But I just think that one is so perfect. And they skirt around the Hitler thing so well. Without yeah. without ever even name dropping him right. um, or having to show him on screen, like they reference him very briefly, but his name is never said, if I'm not mistaken. I think um, at one point he says, "I've I've punched Hitler like over a dozen times or something like that." Oh, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, really quickly. Yep, yeah, but it's just you know it does it so well, set in World War yeah. II, without being like, yeah, um, for any for any family members who are still traumatized by this event that wasn't. Right all that long ago there are still people alive who lived through it um we'll we'll do this nicely and then this one's like nope hitler is the big bad here he comes yeah next kingsman <laughs> um the kingsman third reich 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're probably right about them not moving forward with this uh, this prequel. Although, I, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, they, they like I said, they did set up their big move there. So maybe they are so adamant about continuing this story that they might just go for it no matter what. But uh, I liked it. It's, it's funny you brought up Captain America, the first Avenger, because one of my favorite things about these movies has been the music. And I remember watching the first one and being like, oh, this is definitely Henry Jackman that does the music here. And they use a lot of the same in this. And, and it, it was so long ago that I had even watched the, the first Kingsman um, that I totally forgot about who composed the music. And hearing it now, I was like, oh, that's right. Henry Jackman does the music for this. I really enjoyed this. Turns out he didn't. He didn't do mm. the this movie so uh i was really thrown off by that but then had to go back and see, uh that he had done the previous ones yeah well um have you been following the box office at all i know spider-man's um <laughs> taken everything but have you have you been looking at at box office numbers not beyond number one no <laughs> not beyond number one so um over the weekend this is king's man's the, the king's man first weekend um it grossed about 10 million in the number five spot, um, which is not good. And yeah. <laughs> uh, that's domestic. Internationally, it's only brought in about seven. Uh, and the last one had a bigger international box office gross than, than domestic. Um, so I'm guessing they're really banking on that international market, which just with the state of Omicron um, isn't there. And then China, was another big market for the last one and they have not granted a release date to it. Um, wow. So it might not get a, a theatrical release in China. Uh, so this, I, I, I'm, my prediction is this is the end of the franchise that uh, the last one didn't do the numbers. The first one did. And this one is, is on an even further downward trend in, in part due to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to blame the film 100%, right. uh, but I think a mix of, of the the risk of going to the movies right now with the lackluster reviews and and from what I'm seeing lackluster cinema score, I'm thinking people are gonna wait to stream this and unless it does gangbusters on on streaming or through uh, movie sales on on home video, I think this is the last one. Yeah, maybe we see a straight to Hulu thing or something along those lines in the future. Um, but yeah, I would agree. You said this was the number five spot over the weekend. Yeah, <laughs> I I can't even name four movies that are in theaters right now. So that's oh. that's pretty rough. <laughs> uh, let me take a look at the numbers. So yeah, it's Spider Man No Way Home number one, Sing Two number okay. two. This is really bad because it's streaming. If you have HBO Max, Matrix Resurrections. Yeah, and then I'm sorry, Kingsman's number four. Something called American oh. Underdog is right below it, which is not a sequel to anything. No, uh, that is the, uh, that's the Kurt Warner story that about the yes. NFL quarterback. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's doing almost as well as Kingsman. Uh, so, yeah, not good. But also, like Spider Man's taking um, most of the pie. Like in terms <laughs> yes. of number of theaters playing movies, like Spider Man, if you went to a ten 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 uh, a movie theater with ten screens, odds are seven of them are Spider Man. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would bet most people saw Spider-Man twice before seeing Kingsman. Yeah. Yeah. I would have, I would um, recommend that. Yeah. Actually. I would too. <laughs> I'm being asked about uh, something called Red Rocket. Um, I don't know what that movie is. I don't see it in the top 10. Um, uh, Encanto is uh, number nine, despite streaming on Disney plus now and uh, poor West side story. Um, is number seven, which um, that's a great film if you wanted to go see a movie and you've already seen Spider-Man and did not want to see it again for some weird reason. <laughs> West Side Story is great. I have not seen West Side Story yet. I also haven't seen Encanto yet, and I'm, I'm looking forward to watching that on Disney Plus now. Yeah. Um, but that was at that was at number nine. You said for the weekend, so that's that would be pretty good. If, yeah, that's still Plus, still yeah. pretty good. And you've already got you've got Sing Two, another family friendly animated film um, as competition. So good that Encanto has some legs. Um, I know that one is expected to potentially cross the 100 million mark domestic, which would be the first animated film uh, to do so in 2021. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if it can do it. It's at 88 right now. But yeah, and that's been your box office numbers report for uh, films uh, owned and distributed by the Walt Disney Company. 
Uh, Clearly, anything you had a lot to say about the Kingsman to the point where we're talking about other movies, box office. <laughs> it just, it really, it really underwhelmed me. Like I just, I, and I, and I don't get to see that many movies in theaters anymore. So it's always kind of a, an exciting treat to do so. And so when you, when you go out of your way for it and then it's the, I knew, okay, here's the thing. So in these press screenings and you've been to some, so you can kind of gauge the success of a film by what screen they put it on at the movie theater. You said you had like six other people in your movie screening. Yeah. Uh, mine was maybe like 10 other individual critics, um, but it was in like a small theater, like one of the last ones down the hallway, like the smallest that are at this AMC. Whereas like West Side Story, which is, you know, really, really good. They put that on the Dolby theater. And so <laughs> that was kind of my tell. I was like, yeah, oh, this was in like your smallest theater. Uh, yeah, what's that mean? That's that kind of makes sense. I think if this were coming off of the first Kingsman movie, it might have been different in the the success of that first film. But you know, yeah. we'd already seen the slide going into the second film, and you know, now with people's opinions of the franchise being much lower than what they were, I think the expectations were much lower as well. Um, yeah, that's. I, I mean, I guess with with something like West Side Story, when you have Steven Spielberg attached to anything, that's going to get the Dolby Theater. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, I mean, that one, I know this isn't the Western story one, but like it's his his take on it is so amazing. Uh, that's one that like having a big screen, having Dolby Atmos, um, the the symphonic sound of the whole thing was really enveloping. Um, I highly recommend it. So uh, if you've seen Spider-Man No Way Home more than three times and are looking for something else to watch in a movie theater, West Side Story. Otherwise, go back and see No Way Home again. It it deserves it. I want to see it again. Yeah. I'm How many times have you seen it? No way. I've only, I've only seen it once so far. Oh, and I'm okay. going to see it a second time in a couple of yeah. days. So I'm looking Yeah. Forward. I mean, it is a little bit risky. You are you are taking chances, but yeah. uh, that that one's worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any anything else you want to say, Kingsman or otherwise? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we we gave this movie a hard time obviously, but I want to say the cast was really really good, I thought. Mm -hmm. Um you know, the, like you said, it, it was very heavy in terms of the material. Um but I think Ralph Fiennes acted very well. Um, Jim, I, like I said, I loved Jimon Hanzu, uh, <laughs> Daniel Brühl. Like there was, there was a lot of of big, fairly big names in this movie that that I think really gave it their all. Um, it's not like it was you know half-hearted performances or anything. So there nothing, nothing was at fault there. I don't think, but it, it was um, it was the things around them and what set everything up for them. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just for anybody watching, in terms of what's coming up later for Laughing Place, uh, coming up today at uh, four o'clock Pacific time, Disney Parks Talk Live. I'm assuming that's going to be Doobie, Rebecca, Mike, the usual gang. Um, are you part of that, Mac? Jeremiah is the fourth one. Jeremiah is the fourth one today. So Disney Parks Talk Live at 4 p.m. today. And then tomorrow, 4 p.m. Pacific time, Barely Necessities with the Rebecca's um, and then Disney Trivia Live in the evening, 7.30 with Doobie and Gideon uh, Pacific Time. So uh, do your math for wherever you are. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you have a great day. Take care. Bye.